Let's go before the Lord one more time and, and then we'll uh, begin the message. Lord, once again, we come before you and Lord, I pray that you would give me your words to speak, Lord. And Lord, that uh, you would give us soft hearts to uh, live out this message and ears to hear the message, Lord. God, we pray uh, that you would just give us the courage to be doers of your word and not hearers only. So, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for all that you're going to do and all that you're doing. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting um, how the Lord works. And, and what I mean by that, when, when Troy asked me to preach, you know, the, the first thing... Uh, Typically, we do when, when we know that we're going to be teaching or whatever, and I can pretty much say this for all the pastors, before we, before we start studying, um, we pray. Because it's really not a, 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 an academic pursuit putting a message together. It's spiritual. And you want to make sure you're, we're spirit-led when we, when we start doing this. It's, more of a, it's less of a study uh, as it is more of a uh, being guided, you know, where the Holy Spirit wants to take you. And it's kind of interesting sometimes how, how God's Word just kind of springs forth um, you know, there could be a passage that I've read a thousand times, but that thousand and first time, uh, God just gives it some a different depth that I'd never seen before. And, and I love that about God's Word. You know, Hebrews 4.12 tells us that for the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divisions of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, that first part of that, the word of God is living and powerful. And it is, and it's because it's so living and powerful that, you know, like I said, you can read something a thousand times, and then that thousand and first time, you just get, uh, the Holy Spirit just gives you an insight that you never had before. And, it's, uh, and that's kind of the way, as I was studying for Sunday night, uh, it kind of happened to me in the sense that, I was reading about the Passion Week and, and putting it all together, the chronology of it, and, and you know trying to get the major events. And then there was this one passage that just kind of stopped me in my tracks. And uh, it's from John chapter 18, verse, and we'll read verses 33 through 37. Um, and it says in those, uh, of course, let's think about where we're at here in Scripture to give it a little context. So, you know, Jesus has already had his triumphal entry. He's come in. He's, he's at the point where he's already been bet um, betrayed in the garden. Um, you know, Peter's denied him. Uh, you know, uh, he's gone to, he's now in uh, court, uh, Pilate's court. And so, that's kind of where we're at. We get these verses here. Um, in verse 33, we'll begin. It says, Then Pilate entered the praetorium, again called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And this is the verse that really popped out to me when, uh, you know, it just kind of stopped me in my tracks. Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Then Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. You know, so the part that stopped me in my track is where he says, you know, I have come into this world. Uh, well, I'll just, it says, I am, you say rightly that I am a king. For this I was born and for this cause I have come into the world. You know, think about what's going on here. You know, it's interesting how the religious leaders, um, you know, have, 
accuse Jesus, an innocent man, of, you know, they want to try him or they want to punish him with capital punishment for what? You know, Pilate was saying, there is nothing. I find no fault in this man. And I find it how hypocritical the religious leaders were in the sense that it says, if we back up a little bit in verse 28, it says, then they led Jesus from from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled. I find that interesting. They're accusing a man of a capital offense that they know is innocent, but they don't want to be defiled by going into a building. You know, that's religiosity at its, at its worst, isn't it? You know, this outward appearance, well, I can't go into that building lest I be defiled, but yet I'm going to, I am going to accuse someone of a capital offense that I know they're innocent of because basically I'm jealous of what they're doing. He, he, uh, you know, he's an affront to my status. He's an affront to what we're trying to do. And yet through all of this, Jesus, stayed calm. He knew what was going on. And he says, for this cause, I was born. You know, the title of my message is uh, um, Christ, our Savior was born. It's a Christmas message, you know, and but and as as God was kind of working this message out with me, I thought about that. It was like, you know, um, there's no better time for a Christmas message than leading into Easter. Because if Christ wasn't born, there would be no resurrection. And if there was no resurrection, it wouldn't matter if Christ was born. The two events are tied together. You can't have one without the other and make them happen. So what was the cause that Jesus was talking about? The, co- uh, the cause that he was talking about here in John chapter 18 is that he came to be our Savior. We needed a Savior. You know, we all know um, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, where it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We hear this verse all the time, don't we? We hear at Christmas time, we always hear this verse and it's a wonderful verse and it applies why, uh, you know, why Christ was born. But it wasn't his cause, was it? Those are more attributes of who he was. It was more things that were foretold in the Old Testament. But Matthew chapter one, verse 21 um, really gives us the clue as to why, what that cause was that he's talking about here in John. And it says, and he, and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. That's the crux of why he came. That's why he came, you know, because without a savior, we couldn't be saved, right? You know, it tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we know from Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin are death. And, you know, um, Hebrews 9, 22 tells us, um, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no remissions of sin. You know, without the remissions of sin, without Christ's blood covering our sin, we have no hope. We cannot be saved. And that's really what the message is here. You know, John the Baptist cried out when he saw Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? We needed a we needed a savior because we had all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all deserved hell, but God loved us so much that yet while we were still sinners, you know, Christ died for us. That's the Christmas message, isn't it? That's really the Easter message too. You know, as it, in, you know, as in Revelations 13, 8 proclaims, um, the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world, which is really a, an, ec- uh, an echo of what's being said here, isn't it? it? It's the same thought of what's going on here. And, and you know, the, the thought about this is nothing surprises God, right? Christ knew uh, what he was going to have to do to re- redeem mankind from the foundations of the world. We read that in Ephesians 
chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us acceptable in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of grace. So not only do we have the forgiveness of sins, even more so, you know, we were, we were these, um, you know, wretched little um, uh, uh, sinners, and Christ, adopt, not only did He cleanse us of all that with His blood, but He saved us, He adopted us as His children. You know, we were once orphans because of our sins and, and so far away from Him, yet through His sacrifice on the cross, uh, you know, we've been adopted. We're His own. What a, an amazing thing. What a gracious God we serve. That's the true story of Easter. Have you ever thought about that? That, you know, uh, when did God conceive Christmas? It was from eternity past. He knew this was going to happen. He, you know, it, it's just mind-blowing. You know, like it says, as I quoted Revelation 13, 8, the Lamb of God um, you know, the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. You know, he knew from the very beginning. You know, he knew from before Adam and Eve ever sinned what was going to happen and what it was going to require uh, for us to have hope, to us to have, uh, to be able to be saved. It's just crazy to think about. From the foundations of the world, you know, God knowing that, um, uh, that we would fall for the serpent's lie, right? And, and our pride would get in the way and, and uh, everything else that happened in the garden, um, you know, he planned our redemption so that he could recreate, recreate us in his image. Or as it says in Romans 8, uh, verses 29 and 30, it says, for, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, uh, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. You know, from the foundations of the earth, this plan was already in place. From the earliest part of the Bible, God's redemptive um, plan was seen. All the way, beginning in Genesis chapter 3, you know, right after the fall of man, um, you know, uh, we see God's redemptive plan starting to take place. God knew from the foundations of the world. Could you imagine uh, if you knew from the beginning of your life that you were doomed, that you were, um, uh, although that you were going to, you were innocent, you were going to have, have to suffer for the sins of others through the most horrific capital punishment that could ever be thought. Could you imagine having to live with that burden? But you know what? Most people uh, who die of capital punishment, they die because of their own sins, right? But think about a perfect sinless Savior who knew that uh, he was going to have to die, not for any sin he committed, but for the sins that everyone else uh, who's ever lived or whoever will live committed. You know, that he was going to have to take the brunt of that, of pay that penalty um, for it. What an amazing God. What a gracious, loving God we serve. I, it it's just boggles my mind to even think about that. You know, and, and, and when God spoke the world into existence, he had the redemptive story in mind, didn't he? He had Christmas in mind, didn't he? He had Easter in mind. He knew exactly what it was going to take. He loved us that much because Jesus was the Lamb who was slain from the foundations of the, of the world. It's a, you know, the Bible's about Jesus. Uh, he's our gift. He's God's gift, redemption. You know, born to die in my place, in your place. That's why, that was his ministry, wasn't it? That's why, that's what his cause was here in John chapter 18, and he knew it. 
because the wages of sin are death. He had to die so that we could live, you know, and that we could have the hope of living uh, in eternity. And it, the great thing about God's grace and His mercy is no matter who you are or what you've done, uh, you know, there's nothing that you've done uh, that is so bad that God won't save you. You know, God pre-loved you before you were ever born. God knew exactly every sin you were going to commit, yet He still died for you and me on the cross. So don't let the devil uh, uh, deceive you in the thinking that you've gone too far or that you've, you know, you've committed too many sins or you were too evil in your past or whatever the case. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. Christ already paid for your sins. All you have to do is accept Him and receive His forgiveness. That's what it's all about. You know, and, and like I said, Jesus knew exactly what His cause was. In fact, He tried to warn His followers a few chapters before it in John chapter 12, verses 27 through 33. He says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, the voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of the world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, uh, will draw all people to myself. Then he said this, signifying what death he would die. See, you know, here in John 12, he gives us, he tells us why he must die. And that, you know, where it says if uh, he's lifted up from the earth, it'll draw all peoples to himself. Why? Because uh, as it says earlier in this verse, you know, that, that the ruler of the, uh, of the world will be cast out. Satan will be cast out. Christ defeats death. That's what we celebrate at Easter. You know, death, where are your sting? It's gone. You know, if we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then death doesn't matter anymore, does it? Because, yeah, we'll die in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense, we'll be more alive than we ever were. That's the hope and promise, knowing that we're going to be in heaven with our Savior. And, you know, it's what a wonderful thing that is to think about. You know, and when we celebrate Christmas, you know, the, uh, we celebrate the, the birth of Christ and we think of the little manger scene and this little baby, but that's not really the, the Christmas story fully, is it? That's not precisely um, what it was. You know, um, Galatians 4, chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 tells us that when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as, son, as sons. You know, Christ came in God's time, the fullness of time, it says. But He came with a purpose, didn't He? That He, that he could redeem us. You know, that He could redeem those who were, who were condemned under the law, right? Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, like I said. There's nothing that we could do to earn our salvation. Um, and it was only through what Christ did for us that we have that hope at all. You know, that's why Christ was born, and that's really what the Christmas and Easter message is about. They're pretty much one and the same. I know we, we celebrate kind of a different aspect of them on those days, but they're, um, they're all together. You know, the Old Testament, uh, God shouts really that Christ is coming. You know, the promised one is coming. You know, the promised one is coming to fill that God-shaped void in your heart. You know, that one thing that we're all searching for, whether we want to admit it or not, uh, that one thing, uh, the anointed one, Christ, is coming. It's something that we all need. Isaiah 7, 14 says, um, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she shall call His name Emmanuel. You know, Emmanuel means God with us. You know, God came down on this earth 
And that's, of course, what we celebrate at, at Christmas. But he came down for a purpose. He came down for a reason. He came down to save us, right? That's what it says at Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. Um, says, therefore, when he came into the world, uh, he said, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you have prepared to me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come, and the volume of the books is written of me, to do your will, O God. I love this. You know, it's saying all those, all of those rituals, all that religiosity, it was all just a foretaste of the real thing, of me coming, you know, of, of the true Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All those things were just ritualistic. They were outward. But inwardly, uh, you know, they didn't mean much, did they? They just pointed to our, uh, to a future event of when our Savior was coming. Uh, that's all that did, you know. Yeah, Emmanuel, God is with us. Jesus came down. It gives us a remarkable look at, at really the heart of the Savior before his birth. He knew when he was uh, entering into the world, he was going to be the ultimate and final sacrifice, didn't he? That all those, all those rituals were going to be done away with because they didn't matter. They all looked pointed towards him. You know, the volume of the book um, was written of, about me. And he says, to do your will, O God. You know, how difficult. And we see his human side in the garden, don't we? You know, uh, where he prayed, you know, Lord, if you can take this cup away, but nevertheless, your will uh, not uh, be done, right? Not my will. And how much more so as we get ready to celebrate Easter, should we be praying that same thing? You know, God has called each and every one of us. God has a perfect will for us in his life. There's something that God has created you specifically for. He created you uniquely to be you in the uh and to fulfill his will for your life. And we should have that same kind of heart that Jesus had, right? You know, it, it's one of those things as we think about it, and, and we think about his ultimate purpose. Um, I read this quote about the Christmas story, and it says, uh, here's a side to the Christmas story that isn't often told. Those soft little hands fashioned by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb were made so the nails might be driven through them. Those baby feet, pink and unable to walk, would one day stagger up a dusty hill to be nailed to a cross. The sweet infant's head with sparkling eyes and eager mouth are formed so that someday men might force a crown of thorns onto it. That tender body, warm and soft, wrapped in swaddling clothes, would one day be ripped open by a spear. Jesus was born to die. You know, and that's true. That kind of wraps up Christ, Christmas and Easter together, doesn't it? And, you know, um, it makes me think of, of uh, the, um, the author of Hebrews. He kind of illustrates the full story of, of the birth of um and his sacrificial, of Christ and his sacrificial death. In uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 through 14, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom they from whom all things and by whom all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the uh, captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praises to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had power of death. That is the devil. You know, think about that for, for a moment. It, it says that, you know, he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor. Um, that 
uh, he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. See, we were, before we had a relationship with Jesus Christ, before we um, accepted Jesus into our hearts, we were condemned to death, spiritual death, weren't we? And when we were in that state, we had no way out of it. There's only one way. And Jesus tells us in, in John 14, 6, that he is the way, that he is the truth, and he is the life. There's no other way, uh, you know, but through him. You know, and, and um, it's amazing to think about it as God gives us all of this, as God tells us um, the reason why he came. And he's given us this cause back in our initial text in John chapter 18, you know, um, of the reason why he came, what his cause was. His cause was to save you. His cause was to save me. His cause was so that he could live a perfect sinless life um, and become the perfect sacrifice for your sin and my sin because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. We had no way of making things um, uh, you know, the balance sheet balance out, did we? No, because there was no way that we could possibly pay that debt uh, except through spiritual death. But Christ came. He was born um, so that his glorious plan of redemption could play out for us, right? So that he could be that perfect sacrifice, that sacrifice that took away my sins, that took away your sins. It's the only thing. You know, it's... Um, <clears throat> The Christmas story is it's one of those things where um, the side of the, I'll just read this. It says, uh, here's a side to the Christmas story that the world chooses to ignore. You know, once again, it's a, as you think about those tiny hands and feet uh, of the babe in the manger, remember they were formed with the, in, with the intention that one day nails might be driven through them, affixing them to the cross on Golgotha's uh, heel. The warm and soft little body wrapped in swaddling clothes would one day have a spear thrust through its side. The gentle heart that pumped the royal blood of the Son of God would be broken to pr provide you and me life everlasting. Jesus Christ was born to die. In the shadow of the manger was the cross. You and I cannot truly celebrate Easter or Christmas apart from the broken body and shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot know the joy of Easter without a personal relationship with the Christ of Calvary. Because here's the bottom line, um, you know, and it kind of sums it up in this short little poem or whatever you want to call it. Life is short, death is sure. Sin is the cure, and, or sin is the cause and Christ is the cure. I messed that up. Let me say it one more time. Life is short, death is sure. Sin's the cause and Christ is the cure. I don't care what ails you, Christ is the cure. You know, if it's fear over COVID-19, Christ is the cure. If it's health problems, Christ is the answer. If it's financial problems, Christ is the answer. If it's an unbelieving spouse, Christ is the answer. If, if it's an unbelieving heart in you, Christ is the answer. Whatever the, whatever ails you, whatever, the, whatever um, you're facing, there's only one answer, and it's Christ. Uh, if you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, the only thing you have to look forward to, as it says here, death is sure. You're going to die. Um, you're, and without Christ, you're going to not only die physically, but you're going to die, die spiritually. And believe me, you don't want to do that. The whole key, the whole reason why, the cause that Christ came was so that you didn't have to die spiritually, that you could live forever in heaven with Him. We have the hope and the knowledge of knowing that uh, our perfect Savior came down to this earth. He took the weight of your sins upon Himself so that you wouldn't have to answer for your sins. You've been forgiven. Your sins have been forgiven and, and taken away from you as far as the east is from the west. Um, you know, uh, God will remember your sins no more. But all it does is take that step of faith, that step of faith to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And what a better season there is than right now at Easter. Because the one thing that we know is that uh, we serve a resurrected Lord. 
I said it Sunday night, uh, you know, Christianity isn't about religion. It's about a relationship. And we are the only religion that celebrates an empty tomb. We go visit an empty tomb. You know, any other religion, you can go see where the founder's at and their bones are in there supposedly or whatever. But we celebrate a, a, a living Lord, a living God. You know, He's risen from the dead. And by rising from the dead, we too can live that, um, have that power of the resurrected of the resurrection. In fact, it's so much the case that um, in 1 Corinthians, I'm just going to go over this real quick. Uh, you know, the, the point is very well taken here, and we see the reason for the resurrection, you know, because the, it's interesting that everything in Scripture that God really wants to make sure that there is no doubt about for, in, uh, for instance, that Christ is the Messiah. He gave hundreds of prophecies about where he was going to be born. And he was going to be born of a virgin in the city and you name it. All these events that it made it impossible uh, that anyone else could fulfill all of these prophecies. And it's the same way with his resurrection. You know, there was so many eyewitnesses. There was so many um, uh, even extra biblical accounts of the resurrection that there is more proof of that than almost anything else in ancient history, or probably more than that. And, and we kind of see that, uh, that the risen Christ is our hope. He is our hope. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, it says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Well, like I said, we are the only religion that celebrates an empty tomb because he did rise and he's not there. In verse 14, as it continues on, it says, And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom we did not raise up. If in fact the dead do not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. See what he's saying here? He said, if Christ wouldn't have rose from the dead, our faith would be futile. There would be no, we could just throw this whole book away because it would be senseless. It would be worthless information. It would be a story tale. You know, we might as well read a novel because that's what it would be. But the fact is, is there's power in the fact that Christ did rise from the grave. And that's one of the most, one of the most powerful things there is in the Bible. One of the most uh, provable things in the Bible. Earlier in this chapter, in verse 3, it says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. And what he's talking about there, he's talking about an ancient creed that was within two or three years uh, of the actual event. So there wasn't enough time for any um, you know, legendary uh, corruption to get into the story. It was factual because he goes on to say, all of these people seen it. He was seen by, you know, not only the disciples, but he was seen by these 500, and most of them are still alive. So if you don't believe me, go ask them. There was all kinds of proof, you know, and he wanted to make sure the reader understood that, that, hey, this isn't a fairy tale. This is the truth, and I need you to believe and know in your heart that this is the truth. Why? Because everything hinges on it. And because if it's not the truth, then your faith is futile and there's no reason for you uh, to believe on this. But he is risen. And like I said, we, uh, we celebrate at Easter a risen Lord, an empty tomb. And from that, we have the, um, you know, God's still in the business of performing miracles, doesn't he? That resurrection power didn't stop when he went to be at, um, in heaven, right? No, that he gave us the Holy Spirit, and I see miracles on a daily basis. You know, each one of us that are his sons and daughters, 
We're all a miracle, right? That God would save a wretch like us, as the song goes. You know, we're a miracle of changed lives. And there's no reason why anybody listening on the radio or, or watching on the internet, that that can't be you too. It's simple. God made his redemptive plan very simple. Uh, he's already done all the work. All you have to do is accept the gift of grace that he's given you. It's that simple. Uh, it truly is a Christmas message. And that message is, is I have a gift. And this gift cost me everything. And all you have to do is take that gift and accept that grace and ask God to forgive you of your sins, which he's already paid for. So it, that's all there is to it by faith. Just taking that step of faith and watch what God does in your life. Watch the, the power and, and the love and the hope that replaces all the things that the world, that you have from chasing the world, you know, the, the death and the despair and the disease. Just watch the news. You know, that's all there is. There isn't much hope on the news, is there? But there's hope in Jesus. There's joy in Jesus. Uh, you know, there's, there's security in Jesus. All those things that your heart longed for, all those things that your heart that you ever wanted and um, things that you didn't even know you wanted until you come to that relationship with Christ. God will fill that, um, that God-shaped hole in your heart. And you'll finally be full. You'll finally be that person that you've been called to be. Um, and with that, like I said, if, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, it's very simple. All you have to do is go before the Lord and ask Him to forgive you of your sins and invite Him into your heart and into your life. And what, let, you'll be the next Christmas miracle, the next Easter miracle. There's power in the blood. And so I, uh, I encourage you to read through the accounts of, of uh, you know, the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 1 and, and what Christ sacrificed, the price that he paid so that you didn't have to pay the price for your sins, for your actions. It's a love story like no other written. It's the love story of all, all times. You know, the Bible tells us that God is love and he demonstrates it in all that he sacrificed for us. Amen? Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are and what you did for us, Lord. God, um, you know, it's, it's past tense in the sense that there's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation because you already paid in full um, the price for our sins. And Lord, that you defeated death, Lord. You took the, you took, uh, the sting of death away from from us who believe, Lord. So God, I pray for any out there who don't know you or who are struggling, Lord. God, that they would experience your resurrection power, Lord. And what a re uh, where they too can be alive, Lord. So we pray for any out there who, who are being touched by the Holy Spirit, Lord, that they would uh, take that step of faith and come to know you. So, Lord, I just pray that you would bless each and every one listening to this, Lord. God, that you would bless our, our Resurrection Sunday coming up, Lord. God, that we would, uh, you would help us to uh, just truly understand all that you did for us and how much you love us, Lord, and how much you sacrificed for us. So, Lord, we just thank you and praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.